Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Up and namaste, everybody. Up and namaste. Still in chapter 19. We shall proceed to finish it today. <laughs> All right, shall we start with a prayer? Kindly close your eyes, connect tongue to your palate. Sumi, you'll have to go live somewhere. Don't forget. Okay, so let's close our eyes, connect tongue to the palate. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grandma Sachur Kotsu, to Lord Maha Guruji Meli, to all the great ones, especially to the great beings of knowledge, light, and wisdom, to the great teachers, the great avatars and masters of theosophy, to the Lord Christ, to the Lord Krishna, to our soul and divine self, we humbly ask for your great, great blessings. We also ask for the help and blessings of all the angels and beings of communication of our respective Wi-Fi's and internets. We ask you also to help us to be open and receptive to all the priceless teachings, to all the knowledge being imparted to us today. Help us to have a deeper, clearer understanding of these priceless teachings. Allow us and help us to absorb and assimilate this knowledge and use it to become better divine instruments in your service. We thank you in full faith. So be it. Atma Namaste. Huh? You'll have to bring us. I'm waiting for you. Pin, right? Or stop spotlight? Spotlight is okay. And I'll spotlight. <laughs> yeah, I know you're seeing yourself, Dr. Sagar. That's just Amit doing his. <laughs> I was spotlighting. <laughs> okay, fine. So here we go with our. Uh, Oh, my son kept the Godzilla <laughs> on my desk. Do we have any questions? No. Uh, tomorrow, Sonia, we have Arhatik Kundalini. And uh, Friday, we have Arhatik Dhyan. And then on Saturday, uh, for those of us who are going to be doing levels, again, it's going to be Kundalini. So keeping that in mind, there was that slight uh, change made. Right? Okay, so... Coming back to our chapter on shells, on shields. So we go ahead to talk about, remember we we're talking about uh, the whole concept of the dream and putting the shield only on the etheric body and not on the astral body. And so uh, coming to that part, the second part of that, the shield that you create, right? It actually um, allows the messages from your so-called astral travel to come directly into your physical body without getting... Uh, colored by other thought forms that might be floating in the etheric body. Now coming back to the etheric brain. So we starting with this, the etheric part of the brain being the playground of the creative imagination. I think I mentioned this, but I'm just going to go back to it. Uh, takes an active part in dreams, especially those caused by impressions, both from outside and also that from the cerebral vessels. Yes. And so um, its dreams are usually quite dramatic. So what does it do? It draws and accumulates all the contents that it's got from within, from outside, and then it tends to rearrange it. Uh, it tends to um, recombine it and th through its own fancies, as they put it here. So it decides to do whatever it wants and then gives you this you know, amazing dream with all these special effects. <laughs> but they say uh, it only creates the, uh, uh, the, the, the dream is on the lower world level, right? And so if you want to maintain the purity of your dreams uh, or your experiences in the astral world, one of the things they say the best method uh, while you are still awake is to try to see that your mind is occupied and not idle. Because when it's idle, then all sorts of things that are surrounding us, remember we were talking about thought forms that are floating all around us, depending on the kind of population we live with. And so those start to pour in, right? There is no gate to stop it or close it. And so anything and everything can start pouring it. And so that's why they say uh, the idle man's, uh, you know, um, the, um, what's the thing about the devil? The idle man's brain is like, is, is open to all the devil's things. I forgot the, the idiom anyway. Devil's workshop. 
the devil's workshop thank you so much <laughs> just couldn't remember it for some reason so you've got to remember that it's quite true because it mentions here that when the brain but is, in that case sorry it means that um, the idle mind with the devil's workshop is basically that means you'll be coming up with ideas but it says from without right so that means from outside yeah the outside influences that's why i said you know it starts coming in and then you start thinking of all kinds of other stuff and uh, it can be quite chaotic right because i think within us itself there's enough of stuff going on uh, thoughts emotions our past experiences uh, probably our present experiences everything already causing enough of mm -hmm. havoc yeah. and drama mm -hmm. we don't need an extra one to do that uh, amit is actually singing if you would hear that oh. yeah so it's a song by gabriel called dreams <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh, the the best thing as they mention here is to try to keep your mind occupied obviously with good things and not necessarily unnecessary worry and stress yes and so they say in sleep the etheric part of the brain is of course even more merciful right to the thoughts from outside and so reason why they're saying it is suggested to the student the the technique that was given earlier to actually create a shield so when the shield is there then this kind of external influence doesn't affect the etheric brain and uh if it does it does cause trouble it says and uh they but, say you don't have to create just the no, shell around uh, the whole body that, let me just that, finish the sentence that's Anna. not connected to that but, but let me finish my sentence what you starting a new this sentence this one shell <laughs> Sorry, he needs to know what I'm no, doing. No, this is connected to the rest of the thing. That's what I'm saying. Let's just finish dreams first. The shell around the local area is connected to the rest of the part. You're talking about the shell in the local area. Yeah. Right? So let me finish dreams, then we'll go into shells. Okay, fine. So I'll stop there. He wants me to talk about shells after he he discusses the stuff with you. Go ahead. Okay. Um. Whatever she said, <laughs> and. I didn't understand some parts. Why they're talking about this in this chapter, and what it has to do with the with the shield, apart from okay from outside. But why they're talking about this and what it means, I have no idea. Because of the etheric shield we just created. Yeah, but the sleep. other stuff, like for example, they're saying um, okay, the etheric part of the brain it takes an active uh, part in dreams, especially those caused by impression from outside and from any internal pressure from the cerebral vessels. What is the internal pressure from the cerebral vessels? <laughs> it sounds like sorry. Yeah, sounds like it's, it's your own thoughts. Stroke. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Hopefully, it's not that, but it's just the stuff. You see, it's the brain that we use ultimately to process the information in the dense body. Don't and tell so, this to a medical doctor. <laughs> pressure, there internal, is a medical doctor. Yeah, I know there are. So, <laughs> anyway, um, the dreams usually dramatic. Okay, so what what they're trying to say is. That you have something, uh, if you read the book Achieving Oneness with Iris Soul, they talk about something called inner noises. Okay. Now, these inner noises are actually thoughts that you create, right? Like we've covered this before, I think in a previous chapter, where, you know, you every day or every few minutes or hour, you're thinking of something, right? So every few hours, you think of something, you create thoughts. Now, these thoughts, a lot of them get stuck in the aura, especially ones that you regularly think about. And how many thoughts do you have in a, in a day? How many days are there in a year? And how old are you now? <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff, right? That is why, not only while sleeping or while dreaming, even when you want to sit down to meditate, for those who are beginners, when you try and close your eyes, you start to have uh, these thought forms come in, right? Now, there are two sources of these thoughts. One is from within you and one is from outside you. <laughs> All right. All right. So either you have created them or they have been sent to you. Actually, three. <laughs> three, right? <laughs> now, when I think about it, there are more and more, but three main ones. One is obviously the ones that you think about. All right. So these are these thought forms that, that come in. So this is what they're talking about from the impressions, uh, from the pressure of the cerebral vessels. That's what I think. It's inner noise, right? Inner noise, but basically created by you. Not That's right. And the ones know. that are of low vibration. So basically, you know, you're thinking negative or you're stressed or you're upset or you're working, working. So when you're trying to sleep, when you're trying to meditate, these images keep flashing in front of your face. Uh, and you think it's your brain processing this, but it's actually, it's just uh, the inner, what we call inner noise. And in America, I think the newer term for this uh, I love their word because you see the problem with inner noise is it affects you. It's always around. It's just that when you're trying to sleep or when you're uh, trying to meditate, 
you're more quiet, so you hear it. It's just like that clock, you know, sometimes you don't hear the clock ticking. And then because there is ambient noise, but if it's all quiet, you're trying to sleep, ch -ch -ch, you're like, ah, you know, you can say the noise was always there, but it was because of other stuff. Same thing with the inner noise. You're always, the problem is, the thing is you're always diverted. You're doing your work, you're looking at people, so you're not aware of it. So, uh, but the only time you're aware of it is when you're sleeping or when you're trying to meditate or when you're trying to be still. So every time, you know, the person teaches you, okay, try and be still, be calm. And you're like, oh, I cannot be still, I cannot be calm because more and more stuff comes in. And the problem with that is, have you ever made a decision uh, if you're a businessman or you're at work, uh, when you're under pressure, you know, your subordinates are like, oh, well, we have the stress and you make a decision and then and you might be intelligent, you might be very sharp, very intelligent. Uh, very educated and then later on you look back you're like why did I make such a crazy decision I mean you know the answer was obvious but then at that moment you made a wrong decision now the the reason is not because you're not sharp having a sharp mind is one thing but because of the inner noises the mental body cannot communicate so you can't think clearly okay so there is interference all right now the so so in in the states I think what I've read recently is that they call it what they call it, because they don't know about the concept of energy and inner noise, is they call it brain fog, you know, because everything's foggy. You know, I love their, um, you know, they're very good lingo. at lingo. Yeah, they're marketing lingo. So I have brain fog right now. I can't talk. <laughs> so, I, I think what, uh, you know, when you were saying this, I just remember a couple of things. So it happens when, for example, you know, if you've been working with numbers all through the evening, maybe it's accounts, end of the year, you'll notice when you go to sleep, it's only numbers that come in. Or uh, you've just watched a scary movie. I remember this classmate of mine, uh, she, she always gets scared with things like that. And during Halloween time, we would have these crazy movies coming at some 9.30 in the night or whatever. And she'll sit and watch these. So late. Yeah. <laughs> Those days, it was very late, right? And she'll watch it and go crazy at night. She won't be able to sleep. Next day morning, she's like, oh, I couldn't sleep. I was so scared. I'm like, why? And I said, you do this every year. Yeah, but she loves it. I don't know. Somehow she gets some satisfaction. The emotional body craves. The emotional body. And, and uh, you know, when you watch uh, these, uh, what is that thing? Those games they play with planes and uh, shooting guns. And, and then the whole night goes with, you know, seeing guns and airplanes fly. Probably my son sees dinosaurs, right? So uh, those external influences do affect you, especially when you're going to sleep. Right. And uh, sometimes even when uh, Master Joe would be coming to India and we have the retreat happening, it's quite stressful because, you know, you want to get everything organized effectively. And in the evening, you want to do the meditation. And I'm doing the Twin Hearts meditation. I'm like, OK, I have to call so and so. I have to do this. This report has to be said. Master will need this. <laughs> so even though I'm supposed to be doing the meditation, it's an active meditation. My brain is even more active. Right. So the situation around you at that point, just before you go to sleep or when you're meditating, sometimes does influence you. It might be stronger than other noises or other influences at that point. Yeah. The question is, how do you remove the inner noise? That's yeah. where... That's not given. Yeah. Meditation, <laughs> twin hearts, meditation, the inner breath, really, really, really good at removing the uh, inner noise. And chanting the Chanting the Of course, there are other ways. You can chant, uh, you know what they call uh, japas or, you know, but you need a million of them or two, three million of them for them to take effect. And then by then you've created more inner noise. <laughs> So uh, it's slower, but still effective. Um, now, okay, so that's the cerebral pressure. In dreams are usually dramatic. Okay, so that is, um, so it has, so what they're trying to say is the etheric brain. So, you know, it causes the impression and it uh, accumulates content, recombines it. So it shows you that the etheric brain has consciousness. You know, by saying that it's doing this for some, for the etheric brain, to reconfigure, accumulated, recombine, it's all at its own fancy, shows that the etheric brain has consciousness. For me, that's a that's a big uh, that's a big uh, deal here, you know, because it shows that it has a certain degree of consciousness of its own intelligence, right? The basic because if it did not, it won't be able to reconfigure things, right? The best method of remaining whilst awake, practically impervious to impingement. Now they're talking about. Um, energy from outside right so the energy from outside is either people thinking of you because today social media is very prevalent so uh, you know like I gave the example last time you know people meeting you now people don't even need to meet you everyone is looking at me and I'm looking at you so there's energy interaction or when you see Facebook pictures you know before it was out of sight out of mind 
right, to a certain extent. So you don't really need to think of a person, even though you don't, if a person doesn't like you, they don't really need to think about you. They forget to a certain extent, you know, uh, about you when they're doing, but then suddenly they get a post, Facebook post, Instagram post, are you? Ah, yeah. The thought form keeps coming over and over again. That does not mean you, you, you get off Facebook and social media. The social media and Facebook are very good. Uh, but um, you have to be aware that there are additional uh, aspects to it also. There is an energetic aspect. Okay. There are all, there, at the same time, there are very good, there are, there are a lot of well wishers also sending you good thought forms, good energy. And you have uh, virtual parties as well. You don't have to really go out there. You can stay at home and have your party. True. <laughs> Crazy world now. Now when they have VR, you should be <laughs> more fun. <laughs> okay, uh, so the best method of remaining whilst awake, practically impervious, uh, to the impingement of the thought form, okay, whatever. So, uh, instead of leaving it idle, the door wide open for the streams of inconsequent chaos to pour in. What is the best way? Is to keep the <laughs> brain fully employed. Yeah. What, do you em height. what do you employ the brain with? If you employ the brain so much, then your cerebral uh, pressures will start. <laughs> so you, <laughs> I mean, you see, the issue is, this is a very good point, actually. Why? You have a certain degree of psychic pollution in a city, right? If you're outside in the forest, you see, that's why sometimes you can't think clearly. Many authors, many people who want to be creative, who want to think clearly, including companies nowadays, they want to leave the city, go to a resort or go to a place and spend some time and write a book or, you know, be in a place where there are not too many people. And they do it subconsciously. They don't realize why they do it. For them, it's nature. But actually, there are less thought forms there. There's less what we call psychic pollution. Because of the number of millions and millions of people nowadays living in the city, you have a person producing thoughts above you. You have a, producer, a person producing thoughts below you. You have a person producing thoughts to the right. And you have a person producing thoughts to the left. <laughs> you have people producing thoughts everywhere. Right? And <laughs> oh, even, even under lockdown. Even under lockdown. So, um, so you know, the, the problem is, how do you get rid of this? I mean, so, so it's not, it's not a, it's not a, how can you keep your brain fully employed 24 hours a day? The brain will not get any rest. So this only when you're awake. Oh. Only when you're awake. Well, you know, technically if I'm looking at something, my brain is being employed, right? So, yeah, you know, okay. Now, right. one of the ways you see, one of the ways uh, with, with which you get rid of psychic pollution is uh, imagine it's, it's, it's like pollution. The moment you push it out of the room, right? You might have chanting Om or whatever. It's pollution. It'll come back in, <laughs> right? It's like, it's like uh, imagine like, you know, you remember the thought from they look like smoke or clouds. You blow all around you and then it goes out, away. And then, for some, and then after some time, it will come back, right? So what do you do? Uh, this technique sounds difficult. So in, in a book called Achieving One is to the Higher Soul and even in the course, we teach you that by using uh, the mantra Om, instead of fighting the pollution, all you do is you raise your consciousness above the pollution. Right? It's like you're under turbulence in an aircraft. Instead of going through the turbulence and finding a way to defeat it, all you do is rise above it and it's smooth. So luckily, this psychic pollution, the vibrations are grosser. So they're on a lower level in the, in the inner world or in the earth's aura. So what you do is once you chant the Om, you just increase your vibrations. So your consciousness goes higher. So these psychic pollution don't affect you. So although this method is okay, this, I think the Om is easier, faster, and more effective. Okay. So that's what you do. So before sleeping, uh, actually what Master Cho says, the Om changes your channel. So Master Cho would say, after you come back from work, take some time five, ten minutes. And according to him, he would do it, right? Uh, he would do it. Uh, and chant the mantra or maybe about uh, with the intention to clean your aura and with the intention to increase your vibration or change the channel, so to speak, uh, for about, I forgot what he said now, 27 times. No, you don't need to do it thousand and eight times. You use it 27 times or even nine times if you don't have time, but you know, nine to 27 times. And what it does, according to Master Cho, is it changes the frequency or changes your channel because you are vibrating. You see, from nine to five, you are vibrating at a certain frequency. You're at work. When you come at home, you need to change the frequency. Otherwise, what you notice is sometimes your thinking is still along there. There's no switch off. So according to Master Cho, OM is also very effective to change the channel, change the frequency, to reset. 
Okay, so that is very, very good in removing, uh, uh, you know, these vibrations. And also, whatever energy you bring from outside into the house, you chant the mantra Om, you get rid of that. And so then you are, you know, practically fresh. The problem with Japas is uh, when it's very, very long, uh, sometimes it becomes just something you're saying. You don't really intend or mean it. And though it still has its effect, when you say it with intention, right? So even if you're saying, say, uh, Om Mani Padme Om, Om Namah Shivaya Om, uh, whatever it is that you're saying, Om Namo Ramo, you need to say it with intention, dedicating that chant that you are reciting towards a great being. That's very important. But most people, you know, they'll be talking to you and they'll be with their beads talking and they'll yeah. say, oh, no, they're listening to you and they go, oh, no, you know, that, that's not the most effective. So uh, though they are trying to keep themselves <laughs> occupied, this is more like an automatic thing from the mouth. The brain is occupied with what they're hearing you say or something else that's happening. Yeah. So uh, if you want to do it, you need to focus and try and do it more effectively. Yeah. And also you need to be to a certain extent, if you really, really want to make the Japas less and make it more powerful, you need to be empowered by a highly developed teacher to use that mantra. Yeah. Empowerment is something like giving, uh, being given because you see there are certain reserves of pools of energy to which you can get access to. Uh, maybe I shouldn't talk about that. But anyway, it's an access card. <laughs> you know, it's like a gate pass. <laughs> To, to, to use the energy and to bring down the energy, all right? But you need to use it as soon as it was, it's given. You can't say, ah, you know, I, I got it five years ago. I can still use the, the Japa now. It's almost like it's outdated. It, it will not work as effectively. Upgrade. You, didn't, you weren't there for the upgrade. So <laughs> In you, between. Uh, <laughs> you lost out. You lost out. Um, so, that is, uh, so that is one way of, uh, there was something else also. Now I forgot what I was going to say. All right. In, Someone's ringing a bell. in sleep, the etheric part of the brain, of course, even more at the mercy of outside thought currents. By means suggested above, the shouldn't be able to keep it free. So by shielding or by using the, by means suggested above. So above, it's saying to employ the brain, not to put a shield. But anyway, you can even chant the Om or you can do an invocation or we can basically change your vibration before you sleep so that these things don't affect you. Because the... the if, if energy, it always at a certain frequency. If you're here, it cannot affect you. Okay, so that is, uh, that is uh, what I think of this. There are also other ways. Um, you know, in Delhi, they do certain, um, you know, like in Arhatik Dhyan, we have certain neck movements with the mantra. And, um, and you know, when you use that mantra, like if you go to some Sufis, Sufis in Delhi, I heard, uh, according to Master Chua, when he came, he was telling us, uh, uh, in Delhi, they were doing, but they used the word uh, Allah because they are, uh, you know, from their Sufis. Sufis. So they say Ah La Ah La Ah La. And what that does is, if you look clairvoyantly, this energy comes down and it creates a sort of, uh, not a shield, but you know, this energy flushes away or cleans the um, periphery around them. So when they're practicing stillness and awareness. Uh, then they're not in, they're not bothered by these uh, external uh, energies. They're only uh, 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 you know able to be aware of more of the internal energies, and that is why we do a certain mantra in Arhatic Yoga when we're doing Arhatic Dhyan. One of the reasons. Okay, you can continue. What? <laughs> I didn't talk. I talked. I talked a lot. Sorry again. I'm hoping to finish the chapter. Anyways, so to move on, um, so we're still talking basically about the etheric shell or the etheric shield, right? And so they say that the shield or the shell could be, yes, over the entire etheric body or it could be local to one area, right? And so uh, they give you an example here where they talk about some people are super sensitive. For example, even when they shake hands, uh, they notice that they get affected. And so they say for people like that, you could just put a shield just around the entire palm or maybe half of the hand, right? Now, in Master Chua's school, this is, these are actually called etheric gloves. Very, very effective, especially uh, in the Indian <coughs> tradition when you have a wedding. <laughs> yes, and you're the bride and groom and you have, uh, we don't have 100 people, right? We have an extra zero next to that. So we have like thousands of people coming who you have never met sometimes, who you don't know, many of whom you don't know, a huge percentage. And they want to all shake your hands and wish you because of the happiness and the joy of the, uh, the event. Uh, but if you are sensitive, you do get contaminated with all the different people who are uh, moving through and touching your hands. And so they say it would be good at this point. They say a temporary shield 
can be formed, of course, uh, with the technique that was spoken about yesterday, to protect the hand or the arm <clears throat> and uh, the entry of the so-called uh, charged particles from undesirable uh, sources or energies uh, from undesirable areas will not affect you. Now, another uh, place where I used to use these gloves, not really um, marriage, uh, luckily ours was a very sh small one, only three digits. And um, the point was when we were taking care of Masacho's organization, when the cash would come, we would actually count the cash to see to it that every day we would tally it. So every day when you, when you kind of touch the money, and uh, no offense men, but the money in India is really dirty, <laughs> right? Luckily, it's all gone into circulation and we're getting fresh notes. But if you remember the old notes, right? Whether it's a 100 rupee note, or whether it's a 500 rupee note that you had in the old days, you'll notice they look really dirty. So it's not just physically dirty, but it was also ethically dirty. So by the time you count like a whole bundle, and then you have to put the rubber band and keep it aside, and then the next bundle, your hands really start hurting, right? And uh, we had to clean it regularly. And so when, uh, when Master Cho gave us this whole glove thing, the uh, ethric glove, I thought that was beautiful. <laughs> so I could put the glove you know, on and then count the money even for half an hour, no problem. I, it didn't affect my hands. Yeah. So you could use this and, and the, this is an amazing way in which, at least for me, it really helped me when I would have to count money. You see, when people give you money, um, and this is a bigger talk, so I'll cut it short. When people give you money, it's not just money being given. There's always thoughts and emotions that go with it. So if you receive the money, oh, this is not enough money, I need more money. Or when you give money, oh, I don't want to give the money, I'm forced to give the money, or this and that. So you have to understand that there are many thoughts and emotions that go with when you're interacting and handling money. It's not just done with a blank mind, right? Um, and then uh, number two, there's also stress energy, your energies and all sorts of energy that go into the money when you touch, right? When you touch it. So according to Master Joe, it's like you can make out which city some bills are from depending on the stress levels in the bills. So, so in New York, he would joke about this, like, you know, ah, these bills are from New York <laughs> because they're so, they have a lot of stress energy or something like that. So anyway. All right. So uh, to move on. So there's a similar one they're talking about. Now, this is with reference to resistance to heat or against fire. And so uh, they gave this uh, interesting um, technique, but they say for this, you have to have greater knowledge of magic, right? Uh, and then they say that the shield, the etheric uh, matter that is uh, used, it's of the thinnest layer, yes? And then it's manipulated in such a way and placed over, for example, this whole sheet of hot stone or coal, and people actually are able to walk without burning their feet. Yes, uh, people have, uh, and this I think you've seen, um, I remember seeing it. I think I even walked over it. Um, I, I think it was some, um, I'm not sure if, if it was a festival or something uh, near the mosque. And the coal was there and they were saying, you know, you could walk across it. And I said, okay, let me try. <laughs> and, and that time I had already learned pranic healing. I, I don't know if I put a shield or anything on, on my foot, but definitely walked over it and didn't get burnt. So um, they would create this and they would leave it there. And they say um, the thin layer is placed over the, in, the entire region and it's almost uh, resistant to heat, right? And so when you walk on it, it your leg doesn't get burned. It, it, there's no blister, nothing. But otherwise, when you touch a hot coal, you'll realize your finger's already gone. It's, it's pink and red and then there comes a blister or a bubble. And then they say uh, a similar phenomenon is also seen in spiritual seances and the sitter may be able to actually handle in, in their hand a red hot coal without getting affected, without being burnt. So um, that's another, um, another layer of the etheric which is used to, uh, which is heat resistant, yes? And then we move on to the last part where we actually talk about shields. Now, like they've mentioned, they're only talking about etheric shields and I mentioned this at the beginning as well. How they say, the etheric shield doesn't completely protect you from what you call astral or mental influences. That is the thoughts and emotions completely of others. And so this can still bother you. This can still affect you. And so they say, if you do want to protect yourself of these um, astral influences or mental influences, then you need to use the, the matter, right? Uh, the astral matter or the mental matter to create the shields accordingly. However, they say they're not concerned about it at this point. So they're not talking about it. In Master school, he does teach you how to use this, right? Uh, 
in, in the level of what we call the third level of healing, which is called pranic psychotherapy, you can, from the word itself, psychotherapy, it's got to do with people who are affected psychologically, right? So their emotional body and the mental bodies are quite disturbed. And so to protect them, it's uh, what Master Cho says is, for example, when the physical body is really, really weak, right? And it is susceptible to bacteria, viruses, and is really getting affected. The place we put the physical body in is an ICU, right? So you place the person in the ICU so that they are in a much more sterile environment so that the uh, so-called viruses and bacteria don't affect them as much. And they can be monitored to regain their health and come out, right? And so that environment is required for the physical body to recover. Now with the emotional and mental body, when, say, for example, we go to a counselor, we talk to them, we discuss the matter at home or the matter at the office, which is bothering us, uh, we come back feeling good. But the problem is we go back to an environment at the house or in the office where those emotional and those mental uh, energies which affect you uh, and, and affect your performance start to be thrown at you, you know? So if there's like a gun constantly from that person being shot at you. And then after some time you can't resist and you, you break down. And so Master Cho says, it doesn't help just doing healing or talking in this case like counseling. What you need to do is protect them. And so that's when he says, you need to shield. And, though, and at that point he helps you create these shields to help your patients who are psychologically affected to continue to go and live with their family, uh, work at their work environment and not get as affected and slowly heal emotionally and mentally. And then once they have the strength to deal with it without a shield, then they can live in that environment at home or at the office without being affected by the emotions and thoughts of others because internally they build themselves up. They become stronger to deal with it just like you would in the ICU do, you enhance your immune system, your defense system to become strong enough to go out there, whether there's bacteria or virus around, doesn't matter, I'm strong enough to handle it, yes? And so these shields are very important and the shield that I'm talking about in pranic psychotherapy definitely affects the emotional and mental bodies. Yes, protects us from the emotional and mental emanations or outpourings from out there, from the outside world that could affect us. Sadly, no shield, can ever protect you from yourself. Yes, so what you create in your own head, <laughs> what you create in your own emotional body, no one can protect you from that. Only you can work towards changing the way you think, the way you feel about yourself. That there is no protection uh, with reference to shield. Yeah, there are other techniques, yes, to work on yourself, but definitely not shields. I'll hand this over to Amadar. Um. <laughs> What? I'm, not, I'm really not going to say that much, sister. I, I'm done. I learned my lesson now. Uh, just a little bit. Um, Ekta, you're asking, um, do psychic ammunition uh, affect a healer while doing distant healing? Of course. Of course it can affect. That's why you have to be careful. You have to practice all the steps uh, of, you know, to avoid being contaminated. Because exactly. if you cannot do that, then you will not be able to heal them, right? I mean... <laughs> it's not possible it works both to do ways, it. right? You can't wear a shield and heal others uh, normally. Yeah, uh, there are techniques Master Cho has given, but preferably if you are okay and healthy and well, you should be able to handle your patients. Three, five, ten. All right. So now um, it talks about um, in some cases it's not necessary to sh make the shell around your body, uh, but merely a small local shield to guard oneself as against a special contact. So Sumi has spoken about the gloves. So what I'll speak about is basically, um, you see in many interactions, uh, people subconsciously, they start to connect with you, all right? Um, all the time. And that's completely natural, right? Uh, when you touch someone, there's a connection. And sometimes you feel it, ooh, right? So uh, <laughs> uh, when people look at you, all right, when people look at you, there's a connection, all right? And there's nothing malicious about it, it's part of life. All right. Um, now, when you're strong, all right, if you've been meditating a long time, you're a healer, you're a trainer, you're a boss, um, people look, start to look up to you subconsciously. They start to look up to you for advice, for energy. And what they do is they, uh, these people who look up to you, they start to cord, uh, or what we call uh, send an energy link to uh, your, what we call the back solar plexus chakra. All right. It's almost always on the back solar. Right. Even if they don't know there's such a thing, 
called a back solar plexus. The <laughs> cord goes to the back solar plexus. Okay. That's the, um, link. that's the link. So if you're a teacher, you're a healer, you're a boss, uh, you have to protect your back solar plexus. That's, so that's one of the local areas that you want to protect. You don't need to protect your whole body, just usually the back solar, right? Because people lo always look up to you for strength and for guidance, all right? Um, so basically, there are techniques we, we teach. Uh, now, in psychotherapy, we teach for the patient, but in higher uh, psychic self defense, we teach for healers, for trainers, um, you know, so to shield them from contamination, from unauthorized connections, and any psychic attack or aggressive energy. All right. Um, so we experimented with this when, when, we were, when, when Master Cho was there, uh, the founder of Pranic Healing, uh, a person who healed very regularly. All right. He put a, a, we scan. Okay. If you know how to scan, you just imagine your back solar, just feel with one finger, if you can, or two, same unauthorized connections in my back solar. Okay. Say my back solar plexus, you'll feel something. Then you say unauthorized connection. You feel it suddenly gets really dense. Do you feel that? I, I can't see you. I'm seeing myself. So anyway, it gets, if, if you are, you know, something that you've been interacting with a lot of people, people look up to you, you might not even be, maybe you're a healer, not even a trainer, but a, a boss also. Um, you've been leading certain things. Many of you have been leading Twin Hearts, um, you know, so team, leader. team leaders in your projects. Very dense, right? So one time, uh, so people, uh, you know, we, we, so what we did was we tried to experiment. We put a chakra sheet. Now I've not explained what type and everything uh, because that is not uh, really thought. Um, so initially he had a lot of cords, right? But as they put the shield, um, the cords became lighter and lighter. All right. So I was wondering what is happening. Then Master Chua said, it's in the process of disintegrating. That's why it's becoming lighter because the source, you see, it's like, he, he, what did he say? He was like, ah, people are giving unauthorized electrical connection. You know, like when you try and siphon electricity from the neighbor, I don't think anyone does that that much anymore. But you know, siphoning electricity, he's like, so the, he's like, uh, people are siphoning your energy and they're not paying for the bill. <laughs> It's free Shakti, he would say, you know, put a Shakti meter and then send them a bill every month. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so the most important according to him would be, for example, this is just an example. I'm not trying to teach you how to do it, but according to MCKS, that's why most people, the back solar. All right. Um, so that's basically it. What else? Also the sex chakra and perineum, especially if you're going to interact with people. Those two, you can just make one and just cover both, but we don't teach you the technique, so just forget about it. Um, and then, of course, the gloves Sumi spoken about. So that's what they mean by local localized areas. You want to shield localized areas. And of course, during psychotherapy for patients, you want to shield localized areas. And for the gloves, Masucho was interacting with one of, I don't know whether it's a spiritual guide or one of the healers in the Philippines, not a pranic healer, but I think it was before. And he would say, he would heal. And every time after healing, he would do like this. You know how the doctors just remove their gloves and throw it? He would just do it like this. He would take it out and throw. And he would not see, Master would not see anything. He's like, so he was using gloves while healing. All right. So he was using gloves while healing. But of course, if you don't know that there's a certain technology for that also. Otherwise, it interferes with the healing process. Okay. Um, now, regarding the fire walking, fire ceremonies, it's similar to the uh, experiment that I spoke about in the previous sessions about the person, you know, the Shaolin and hitting the baseball bat and the experiment with the glove and all that stuff. So that is, um, that is the whole idea. Okay. Um, now, it does not require really, really um, very fancy energy. It just requires... Uh, a different set of energy centers to be used as source energy centers. So the uh, prana is more physicalized. So you have to basically physicalize and concretize the prana. So it becomes really uh, impervious even to physical touch. All right. And for that, you need, um, uh, uh, anyway. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay. So of course. You do. No? You do. And of course, uh, we recognize that the shells and shields uh, have been speaking. Of course, just to give you a hint, you know that the navel has to do with the lower chakras, but so that's one of them, but not all of them. Uh, and of course, the basic has to do with physical, right? It's the physical kingdom in the Lord Spear. That's another one, but not all of them. Um, now, um, so for purpose shells of the material of those planes would have been employed. This is already, so we couldn't actually. 
All right, so a couple of things. So as a healer, very good job. Very good job, very good. So when you talk about shields, right? Uh, if you are wearing a shield as a healer, what happens is when the healer sends any thought towards you or their energy is coming towards you, because you're having a shield, it has what is called a boomerang effect. So it comes and it goes back to them, making their condition yeah. worse, right? I spoke about that. And so, oh uh, yeah. So uh, not recommended for you as a healer to wear. Uh, secondly, you do not want to put it on the patient as well. Not in the beginning. You put the shield always at the end. So one of the things that uh, we're taught in pranic healing is that before you try to put a shield on any person, your patient, you have to see that the condition in, internally, right? Both physically, emotionally, mentally, whatever it is that you're healing, is good in a good healthy state. The person is uh, more or less balanced before you want to put the shield, not before that. Right? So don't put the shield on the patient and then start working on it. It, it only makes your work harder, not really yeah. anything else. So pulling out things and putting in things <clears throat> into the uh, respective areas or energy centers might become more difficult. Secondly, if you want to, uh, you can wear etheric gloves and, and try and do cleansing, right? But you can't do it with energizing. So once you finish cleaning, you need to take off your gloves and then energize with your hands. Uh, wearing... Um, Chakral shields on your back solar plex is not recommended because when you want to treat a patient, the connection between you and your patient is on both solar plexus chakras, which means then your connection to them might actually become much less, right? Um, the other thing to do is if you are regularly healing, please don't forget to cleanse your hands with salt water. And then after all your healings, please have a salt water bath on a regular basis. You really have to avoid contamination. Even if you're a massage therapist, medical doctor, uh, medical anything doctors, to do with yes. touching uh, a lot of people uh, who are not uh, very uh, physically healthy. Um, recommend. So I would uh, really recommend it. And if you know of cutting of cords, uh, again, another recommendation at the end of healings uh, of all your patients, uh, you need to try and cut the links as well. These are very important to retain your health, right? And you have to be healthy if you want to heal others. And so uh, continuing with your regular regime of exercise, breathing exercises, meditation would further enhance your systems to resist against uh, further contamination as well. Yeah, keep your spleen especially very clean. Uh, Amit has mentioned this several times. Very important for us as healers to keep our spleen healthy and clean, right? So that's basically uh, some of the things that we can talk about. So by gloves, you mean shield the hand miner? No, you just no, no. basically, if like you read the, read the Psychic Self Defense book by Grandma Sachoa, Practical Psychic Self self defense for home and office basically you just imagine two balloons around your hand and then you compress you know like a lamination machine <laughs> oh, but just there's a sudden, like your there's a sudden prana gloves. that you need to use yeah. and then uh, you make it internally permeable don't forget and then um thank you so, okay that's your welcome and then um now with reference to cords uh salt water bar doesn't do too much with cords but uh, mm -hmm. the general sweeping according to master hector does yeah. Yeah. So, Even normal localized sweeping removes cords. Yeah, localized sweeping. But also. not uh, all the time. And there are how much of it with salt? We are not too sure. I'm not expecting. Maybe if it's consecrated, it it would. But Probably. Yeah. yeah. So that's basically it. Okay. Shall we move? Yeah. Okay. Can you shield your back solar while you're in, uh, you can, uh, in a closed room? Sure. Is it healthier? Somehow I'm getting worse. Zim exercises uh, in closed rooms. Now it's okay. Um, I usually, when I go to the gym, when I could go to the gym, <laughs> I would prefer to go there where there are less people because otherwise, you know, when they're, all the machines are being used, everyone's expelling. And I don't want to be around them when they're expelling. So I prefer to go either earlier or much later to avoid that. Uh, that's just me. Um, if you don't have any other choice, I would still go when everyone else is there. Not a problem. And then come and have a nice bath. Uh, the other is, um, is it possible to program the etheric brain? Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's easy. easier said than done. Yes. Remember, if you're starting to have ailments of the patient, it's got to do with you being very, very sensitive and very empathetic, which means that you literally feel everything that your patients feel. So you have to really learn to distant and you really have to cut cords because once your patient is gone, you've taken care of your patient. That's it. Till they come day after tomorrow or tomorrow. Don't worry about the patient. Make yeah. sure you cut the cords. You have to really seriously do that properly. Yep. Yeah? So moving on to the next chapter, very, very quickly. Oh, it's very quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mediumship. So 
this is um, an interesting topic, uh, something that I'm not fully, um, I don't fully comprehend or have an experience. So it's literally going to be new knowledge for all of us. So the medium is basically an extraordinary person or an abnormal person. What is an abnormally organized person? Like a perfectionist or <laughs> no. like an anal person? No, like in modern terms, they, they, call it it's basically someone who has good control, right? So I think they're basically talking about uh, this kind of person, which is also not very... Uh, but what is organized? Common. Huh? Ah, his ethnic body is abnormally organized. <laughs> A okay, medium is an abnormally organized person. So right? they're talking about the ethnic body is abnormally organized. Okay. Yes. And so they are able to then separate Set their up. ethnic body and their dense body while still being awake. Like anesthesia. Yes? Yeah. We are not, we, this is not anesthesia. Uh, this is not, uh, you know, what was that passing of whatever? It's not that. And it's definitely not uh, you going to sleep, right? Where, where there could be a, a shift in this these people while awake can actually move their etheric body out of themselves and still uh, survive in their physical body. So the etheric double basically extru it kind of extends itself outwards, right? And uh, largely supplies things that can materialize through it. That's what I understood. But the etheric so, double always extrudes. No, no, it does, but it's extruding beyond the physical body. Like it's completely gone out of my physical body. It's there. Hmm. Right, it's a completely, it's completely outside of mind. So it basically says, such materialized form are usually strictly confined to the immediate surrounding of that medium. It cannot go like into my neighbor's house and uh, far away. It, it is more closely associated with the space around the medium itself. The matter of which they are composed being subject to an attraction, which means this etheric body prefers to come back to the source, that is to the medium. It does not want to wander off all around. So it can go out, but its basic attraction is to come back to where it came from, which is the medium itself, right? So it does not stay outside for too long. That's my understanding. So it basically wants to draw back towards the body of the medium. Yes, and does not stay there for too long. So it says, so if it is kept away from the medium for too long, the figure, whatever figure is within that uh, form collapses, the matter which uh, composes is instantly rushed back then towards the medium, right? So whatever goes, it, it pushes the etheric body out. There is certain forms that are created and uh, it wants to come back because it's attracted back to the medium. And so if you, it takes too long, that whatever shape kind of collapses, but again, it gets withdrawn into the medium. Yes. So that's my understanding at that point. And I'll go uh, through one more line before I give it to Amit. And so it says, such forms are able to exist only for a few moments, yes? And amidst uh, brilliant light, the vibrations of brilliant light. So it needs a lot of light. And uh, the person has this amazing technique of moving her or his etheric body out. It stays there for a few minutes. It can take certain shapes and then it comes back, right? And so in those few minutes, other things can happen. Yep. So we'll talk about that in a bit. I'll hand it over to are you. Otherwise, about, next. Are they talking about channeling someone? Being? Not yet. What is they doing all this time with extending? Why are they doing that? But it can be dangerous because, you know, remember there are other entities that are wandering around and if they find, oh, there's an ethnic double there, <laughs> let's get into it. It can be okay. problematic. Look, this is what I guess, okay? And it's a wild guess, right? That's what I can intuit from what they're trying to say. Uh, medium, whatever she said, is basically someone who has the ability to take some of their external matter. So they, are, they have this abnormal uh, or <laughs> uh, a, a different type of, their ethnic body is differently configured, you can say, a different configuration, all right, from the normal ethnic bodies where they are allowed to withdraw ethnic matter from certain parts of their body, extend it away. So you have the physical body, then you have the ethnic body, and then they can take a portion of the ethnic body and hover it around away from them, stretch it away. For a person with an astral body or, um, or uh, another being to possess that portion of that etheric matter, which will be linked to their etheric body and also their physical body, which will make them do things. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. That's what I think. That's what I, I understand. And you cannot keep that stretch for too long 
especially if the being occupying that is of high, high development, manifesting as great light, the person's etheric body cannot handle that load because they're still constricted with their energy. And then, uh, you know, what stretches has to come back. So it, it cannot be done for extended periods of time. It can, it has to come back. Really? Make sense? Yes, yeah. something like that. Something like that. Uh, don't try it at home. Yeah, don't try <laughs> Don't it try anytime. walking on coal at home also. <laughs> All right. Don't go into a tandoor. Anyway, um, barbecue. Uh, okay, so the figure collapses. So the figure collapses. So basically the figure, you know, it probably takes a mold or whatever. Yeah. Um, now such forms able to exist for a few months. So that's it. I explained it already. See? Okay, now the... The person who's doing this, right, the medium or the mediumship uh, that they are able to do is quite um, dangerous in the sense that because you've got to remember that the etheric body is super important for the prana to circulate within our system, right? And so if this etheric body is going to be pushed out, then prana cannot then survive within the body, right? And so they say that uh, partially at that point, the prana cannot circulate, yes, because of the absence of etheric matter. And uh, what also happens is that the dense body al almost suspends its vital activities. Now, if this is kept on for too long, they say that it can give rise to nervous strain and disturbances. Yes, and so one has to be careful if they can do this. Uh, it cannot be used for too long. And uh, thus, it ends by saying that the most common danger is that after this episode happens, right? They've, they've been able to extend it. Maybe some entity used it. And when the etheric body comes back, they are super exhausted. They are drained. One, of course, uh, the, the, the obvious reason for us is because there is no etheric matter. and There's no prana going into that body, whether it's for five seconds or 10 seconds, it still makes a difference. And if the vital organs are kind of suspended, that also is important for the body. You can't just suspend everything. Uh, and if they're doing it on a regular basis, it can cause injury in the long run, right? And so they say that uh, these people get terribly drained of vital energy. And so... Um, the reason why in many of the seances, you'll notice that once that whole episode happens, they communicate or translate or whatever it is, they just fall. They collapse on the floor, on the chair. And uh, I think later on, uh, uh, Sir William... Uh, wait, 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 I won't be able to finish. No, no, I'm, not just, I'm just going to say that. Okay. He actually says they actually look pale, right? Like they went in for surgery or something and came out. So that's got to do with the entire vitality to an extent, for that moment of time, being drained out of the body, not being drained, not even being received. So the body has literally been starved of vitality, which it requires to survive. Remember, the life in this body is dependent on that. And so if that doesn't come, we're going to look lifeless. Yes, you're going to look pale. You're going to look like uh, you probably uh, touched death and came back, right? And so just to end, uh, so it says here that they tend to collapse. Also, why so many mediums eventually become drunkards they, they, they move towards using drugs or stimulants because they have to take this in order, in order to satisfy the terrible craving for support which they require um, after the, the, the uh, seances or the event that occurs because of the sudden loss of strength or in this case, sudden loss of vitality. And so they need other substances to be able to feel that they can actually feel stronger. Yep. That's it for today from me. Over to Amit. If I can talk in that much time. No, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so the conditions of mediaship on the whole, um, fortunately, rare, it gives rise to nervous strain. See, basically, the, what you're doing is when you're removing etheric matter from somewhere, um, this etheric matter is doing a certain purpose and you're renting it out because it says yeah, when okay. the etheric double is extruded, the double itself is rent in twine. So uh, twine is... Twain is basically uh, an old word for two, I think, right? Uh, so it's like you're renting it to, uh, you're making it into two. And so this duplicating takes a significant amount of energy. And uh, the basically the communication between the etheric body, the astral body, and the physical body is all disrupted during that time. Because someone else is going to use it as, um, as a, you know, um, is renting it out <laughs> for some time. That's what I think. So it's definitely not a good idea 
because it produces lethargy because the body probably gets exhausted trying to absorb the amount of prana required to sustain this whole activity. And also the other parts of the etheric body are strained in, in sustaining the whole body because uh, a part of it is rented out somewhere. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now, the terrible drain and vitality set up with withdrawal uh, of the means by which the prana is circulated is the reason why mediums are often state collapse. Because they're not using external energy, they're using their own energy. So if you remember, um, you know, you, you remember the example I gave about the person in the mental institute, right? Uh, who, you know, the basic became big, the main man became big. Uh, I don't know if you remember it from previous, did I speak about that? I spoke about it, right? So, uh, so this in this one, uh, the person collapsed because they're not being energized from outside. They're using their own energy to do all this, and they can only absorb energy at a certain rate, certain uh, you know rate. So that is why uh, they're exhausted. And the reason they create the stimulants in my idea, I wouldn't know because I've never met and interviewed or discussed with mediums, uh, is probably because if you remember the atomic web um, uh, chapter, we spoke about the effect on cocaine and certain drugs. Uh, uh, you know, stimulating the uh, Ming Min and the basic chakra, which is like, for those of you done healing, pranic healing, it's like master healing technique, where you have tremendous surge of energy. So they get their fastest surge of energy through these uh, stimulants and drugs. So that's why they take it because they need to get that boost again, especially if they have to do another channeling or they have to become medium over and over again, because generally you just don't do one. Yeah. I don't know what this chapter is about. This is what I, I'm producing. Medium is like, you know, those things. Greg, we just started watching a movie on... Not yet. Oh, <laughs> not yet. We'll tell you... Uh, I told right. you already later. Okay, so basically, um, I've not met someone and I don't know anybody who knows someone who does this anymore. I've just watched it in movies. Uh, so if you remember Ghost, you remember that movie? It's a really cute movie. And Whoopi Goldberg is this media, right? And she allows the ghost to come in and use her and then... Uh, so that that is one way, but they show it more in, in, in a different light. But I think honestly, uh, anybody renting your system, it's going to cause havoc to you. Yeah. Yes, because you don't know their energy. You're not compatible with them. Even if it's compatible, it's, it's still uh, a big risk. This is different from if you're highly developed. You see there are beings in the inner world, but they're you know, at a certain plane, if your consciousness can reach that plane and your consciousness can not only reach it uh, and it can bring down from that vibration into your physical body and your brain can assimilate, process that information, then there's no mediumship in that. That is just communication. It's different from mediums. Correct. So there are beings who you can interact with in the higher worlds or the inner world and you can have whole talks without getting depleted because they're not possessing or taking part of an extended extruded portion of your ethnic body they're actually um, just in the inner world you're going to them <laughs> rather than they come to you because they can't go down i heard below a certain level of vibration yes yeah, so, so uh, another thing that i uh, i remember about okay no, I think it's gone let's close all right, let's go. <laughs> Sorry, so, I was going to say something, it just disappeared. Uh, multitasking. Okay, so done. Yep. Yeah, so, so let's close our eyes. We'll meet you on Friday in the evening to continue with uh, mediums. Yeah. Medium. Inhale and exhale, relax the body. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chokha, Sri Lord Maha Guruji Mele. To all the great ones, especially the great beings of knowledge, light, and wisdom, to our teachers, especially to the great teachers of theosophy, the great masters and avatars, to our soul and divine selves, to the angels and beings of communication, we thank you all for your great, great blessings, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance all through the session. Thank you, especially helping us gain greater clarity, greater understanding of these priceless teachings. Help us to absorb and assimilate this and use it to become better divine instruments with thanks and in full faith so be it thank you everybody atma namaste and we'll see you either tomorrow morning or we'll see you friday evening bye 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 take care ending for all